What many MPs um, have not engaged themselves with is that the rules allow minority report. They can actually be five. There was a case here when we had about four. Madam Speaker, this particular bill, as the main report uh, um, has said, this particular bill is not as complicated. In fact, my understanding is that uh, URI is only asking for presence when goods are being destroyed as the chair. Um, but let me, because this is a short report, let, let me read it, uh, um, the parts that are important. This particular bill, Madam Speaker, compliance with the law, the Certificate of Financial Implication the Minister of Finance, Matia Kasaija, issued for this bill does not meet the requirements of Section 76 of the Public Finance. The certificate the Minister issued reads, Revenue expected from... Revenue is expected from improved compliance but cannot be quantified at the present. The clarification in when a report is being read. Yes. You know, those are issues you can raise after. The minister, the certificate the minister issued reads, revenue is expected from... Shadow cabinet is doing a good job. For Madam Speaker and Honourable Members, the certificate issued by the minister does not meet the requirements of section 70, 76 of the Public Finance Management Act. The certificate issued reads revenue is expected from improved compliance but cannot be quantified at the present. This statement, this is statement by the Minister of Finance offends the section above, which require him to indicate the estimates of revenue and expenditure over a period of not less than two years after the coming into effect of the bill. The certificate must also indicate the impact of the bill on the economy. The law did not envisage as a minister who will present a bill to parliament with no comprehensive study. Every legislation brought here seeks to cure a mischief. What mischief is the minister seeking to cure with no quantifiable benefit? Yet the same minister in his letter introducing the domestic revenue mobilization strategy for Uganda 2019-20, committed to end arbitrariness. The minister said, in order to achieve our revenue potential, we will move away from ad hoc annual tax policy changes. These piecemeal adjustments with little alignments and overreaching strategy have created a high degree of unpredictability and uncertainty in our tax policy direction. The domestic revenue mobilization strategy will address this as well as ensure that our future tax policy embodies the principles of simplicity, fairness, citizen welfare and sustainability. This is the commitment the minister made to the country in writing. This parliament must hold him to his commitment. We should hold him to his commitment. Maybe he is carrying out a study and he wants to use parliament as a respondent. This will be very unfortunate if that is his intention. Parliament should therefore not allow this minister to use it for this purpose. Madam Speaker, 
that is the minority on this exercise, uh, on this uh, tax procedure code amendment bill. The minority report has three areas of dissent. But maybe to make it uh, very clear from the beginning, <clears throat> let me begin with the introduction. The stamp duty was read for first for the first time on March 28th, referred to the committee. The main issue in this bill, and that's why I wanted to start with the introduction. The main issue in this bill is tax exemption. The beneficiaries of this exemption include manufacturer of electric vehicle, electric vehicle battery, electric vehicle charging equipment, or a fabricator of the frame, and the body of an electric vehicle. National referral hospitals have been, national referral hospitals have been benefiting, but this bill now is saying you did it. So the, once that has been dealt with, mainly exemptions, the first area of the same is non-compliance with the law. The Public Finance Management Act, let me read very quickly, makes it a requirement that every bill presented to Parliament shall be accompanied by a certificate of financial implication. This certificate under Section 76 of the Act state the certificate shall indicate the estimates of revenue and expenditure over a period of not less than two years and after the coming into effect of the bill when passed. The certificate shall indicate the impact of the bill on the economy. This in simple terms means total amount to be spent on implementation of the law and expected revenue. In this case, the amount foregone when we exempt and intended benefits. The difficult financial implication that the Honorable Matia Kasaija issued on March 27th before the bill was presented one day does not meet this requirement. It reads, since this is an amendment to existing tax provision, there is no expenditure plan specifically different from the overall allocation of six, 619.9 billion and uh, 534 billion for Uganda Revenue Authority for these years. And as I noted in earlier, all the five certificate financial implications the minister issued for the bills bear the same statement. When it came to amendment, the Honorable Matia Kasaja stated revenue expected from revenue is expected from improved compliance but cannot be quantified. We are dealing with this one now. We thank the minister for being honest and kindly advise him to withdraw this particular bill. Minister, please quantify the benefits as ordered by the law and return to Parliament when you are ready. The Domestic Revenue Mobilization Strategy and Monitoring Plan for Financial Year 2020-2023 observed that the majority of the tax law amendments are not informed by tax-related analytical briefs. This is what this certificate confirms. Yet the same minister, in his letter introducing the domestic revenue mobilization strategy, committed to end this sort of arbitrariness. He said, in order to achieve our revenue potential, we will move away from ad hoc annual tax policy changes. These piecemeal adjustments with the little adjustment, with, with little alignment to an overreaching strategy have created a high degree of unpredictability and uncertainty in our tax policy direction. The revenue mobilization strategy will address this as well as ensure that our future tax policy embodies the principles of simplicity, fairness, citizen welfare, and sustainability. This is the commitment the minister made to the country in writing. This parliament must hold him to his commitment. The certificate doesn't show the overall impact of the new tax proposals on the economy. Moreover, Parliament recommended that in addition, every bill should be accompanied by a standalone evaluation or regulatory impact assessment. Number four, there is no comprehensive taxation policy in Uganda. Let Honorable Speaker and Honorable Members, 
on May 5th, 2022, these concerns were raised. I don't have to go through this again by two MPs who presented a, a motion here. Those MPs are the Honorable Javira Semwanga MP Buyamba and the Honorable Dixon Kateshumba, former Commissioner Domestic Tax, the actual one, Customs, sorry. If you go to, um, let me go to where the Honorable Kateshumba, where I'm quoting Honorable Kateshumba. During the debate, the Honorable Kateshumba Dixon, former Commissioner, said, we need to base our tax decisions on a structured policy rather than relying on other negotiations. This approach will enable us to uphold the principles we aim for and foster investment within our country. That's what uh, this tax expert won this parliament. I don't have to repeat what the Honorable Asuman Vasari said. So, right, Honorable Speaker, in the absence of such a comprehensive taxation policy, the hands of this parliament are tied. Solution is to ask government to withdraw the bill the bills and return when they are ready. I don't know how long you will want to babysit. I did uh, say that the Honorable Musasizi and his senior, the Honorable Matia Kasaija, two adults who are not following the law. I now go to the last part of the minority, which is the tax exemption. And I want to invite Parliament to be very careful. The only study this Parliament can rely on to exempt taxes again is the report of the Auditor General for the financial year closing June 2023. The Auditor General reports on page 178 of his report as follows. Although the tax incentives and exemptions are expected to free up the capital so as to enable those companies to employ more staff, a total of 22 companies out of 36 that obtain the incentives were performing below 50% threshold and thus had not fully achieved the desired employment levels, 22 out of 36. Dr. General, I am quoting, I noted that over the period under review, taxes waived by government amounted to 1.4 trillion. These comprised 1.2 trillion waived under the Gazette by Parliament, direct waivers by the Minister totaling 218 billion, as well as tax exemptions as per the Income Tax Act under Section 21, granted by the Commissioner General of 5.5 billion. The Auditor General is therefore advising Parliament to stop tax exemptions because they are not serving the purpose. You may not listen to the opposition, but at least listen to the Auditor General. So this is what, uh, because this whole this whole proposal is about tax exemptions and a list of beneficiaries. And the Auditor General, just for emphasis, has said we forego 1.4 trillion in tax exemptions. At the beginning of this whole exercise, Madam Speaker, if you allow me now to speak for one minute as a shadow minister, we are being stampeded. You are undermining the budget because this is where money is going to be raised. These whole taxes combined, all of them that we are processing now, they are going to raise an additional shilling, just about 300 billion. But you are exempting to the tune of 1.4 trillion. And then you come here and Parliament is wasting its time to look for 300 billion, yet you are exempting 1.4. I therefore want to invite Parliament for this particular and to reject all of it, if not for the problem of the certificate of financial implication. At least as I said, listen to the Auditor General. You may not listen to us. He's warning you that people you are exempting from taxes are not giving you benefits. And then the government comes here trafficking another law to say we now ex exempt more. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker and Honorable Members. Thank you. Thank you. Well, see me, Matu. Only one who's so cute, la 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 la. Omo gugu gwebizu yetaka gukuti kudwa. Brand Property Services Limited. Kureta keri tali konka yana. Enyumbi zwe doku zimbiwa. Omo ne zoku pangsa. Apartments zoku pangsa. Omo no kugula. Mama wanga genja ulu. Okuli Uganda, Kenya, Bongereza, Dubai, America. Omo ne Canada. Okuda bidi zenyumba. Obe bizi mbiyo. Property Management. Naba sawe yaba kugu. Abata ukfere. Tuwe kwate. Konsonga zone 
ze kusa kubyetaka nga kuota denu kugwera ku chapa cho kati pazo yebetake badde kukalubiriza egonjo dwa bo kwata ganye na fe tukubire ku noti musanvu noti 3 munana bili nya noti musanvu mwenda oba noti musanvu musanvu 3 bili mukaga tano munana noti obotu sange ko empty house omwali ro gusoka room 5 e wazana ku Entebbe road okulirana ekizimbe cha mugulume empire tuchalire ko ne ku website ya fe www .brandpro.co.ug Brand Pro Property Services Limited Tutu Kiliza Biloto Madam, Madam Speaker I think, I think we need to understand why the law was made the way it was <clears throat> The fact that the minister wants the law changed the lawyers say there must be a mischief that you are seeking to cure even if you didn't do economics, what you will come here and tell the parliament, because the law that is being referred to here that we have just changed, the tax procedures code, you want to be present when goods are being destroyed, which is innocent. All that you need to do is to look at the history. How many of such incidents happened last financial year? And then you will know they were worth how much. But you can't come here and claim with your economics that I cannot quantify. Let's not hide. Where you have made Anna, a mistake, Anna, agree Anna. and then say sorry and we move on. But you can't come here and say it is difficult to quantify. Because these goods have been destroyed before and you know how worth they were. So that's the, the figure you bring here and say because of this we have lost so much, much income because you are not present and we can't Honorable be sure. Members. Thank you. The minority reports are raised under rules of procedure, under rule 205. It can be a member or members. So members, I want to tell you that the rules are also allow you to raise as many minority reports. But as you are many, if you become more than the, the main report, then you become the majority report. The other one becomes the minority what? report, even if it has the chair as a, the one leading it. And Madam Chair, in this house, we have ever had the chairperson and his vice writing a minority report during the time of Honorable Stephen Tosobia on the Temangalo case. So, Madam but, Speaker, the but, one. But we had a minority report of Honorable August Lee. As the chair. Who, uh, uh, which took the day. Uh, which took the day. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, I'm raising the, the one I'm raising is on Section 40D, which the Chairman has talked about, wave of interest on payment of principal tax. Madam Speaker, we know that we have been, there are so many challenges with the implementation of Shadow 40D of the Principal Act, which provides for a waiver of interest and a penalty. In the practice, URS E system currently applies. Section 4D, 40D together with Section 38, which essentially compounds the outstanding principle as inclusive of any interest and a penalty outstanding. They therefore note that the proposed amendment should be introduced along to clear and practical implementation guidelines, indicating that the payments should be applied first to principal tax until it's exhausted. Then the balance can be applied to interest and a penalty. Then than to be applied on interest concurrently with the principal. Madam Speaker, this, will always, this always penalizes compliant taxpayers at the time of waiving interest and a penalty. So Madam Speaker, I was just our recommendation is that uh, Section 42 of the Act is amended with a clear provision that for avoid, avoidance of doubt, avoidance of any doubt, and the payment tax should be applied to outstanding principal first until it's exhausted before interest is paid yes. or waived. Madam yes. Speaker, it is a simple demonstration. There are two taxpayers. Madam Speaker, on the committee as it has raised, it's saying, first of all, there are ledger issues with URA which are not even in the law. The, what I want to put up across, for example, you are two taxpayers. Each of you has a principal tax of 100,000 with interest of 50. When you go and pay your money, what you are it does, it will apportion the money again as partly to the principal and then some to the interest. 
Now, I want to give two scenarios. I, Nandala, I am a good taxpayer. Amos, our chair, is a bad taxpayer. Okay. <laughs> no. It, it, no, I have never. So, Madam Chair, it is okay. Amos have withdrawn. Okay. There are two taxpayers, A and B. Uh, one is a good taxpayer. He tries to pay his tax. So as he's paying his tax, part is used against the principal and partly at the interest. Now I want to give a scenario. 100,000 interest, 50,000 and penalty. Now the bad one waits knowing that the committee, parliament one day will waive. Now when it is waiving, for him, they will waive the whole interest and the principal will be allowed to pay will be 100,000. While the other one who did some part payments, he paid 65,000. Just one minute. Don't worry. You, you, you are just a, a LDU. Listen. Uh, uh, 70,000. Order. 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 <laughs> Madam Speaker, I you allowed me. I have refused your order. Order. You don't get order. Order. From order. You. order. The Speaker has refused. Order. Order. Madam Speaker, is somebody Respect allowed to order. get a microphone before you tell him? Order, Madam Speaker. What? Honourable members, decorum. Madam decorum Speaker. is very important. What was your issue? Madam Speaker, he got up and got a uh, microphone. Uh, what is the amendment you bring? Madam Speaker, the amendment is, is simply that when a taxpayer pays money, it must be first be applied towards the principal before applying it to interest and Penalty. You come. But, but I, I thought... Thank you so much, Honorable Nandala, for accepting so where are you my now? clarification. The issue we are dealing with, which the committee has proposed, is that we have taxpayers who are experiencing difficulties in uh, meeting their tax obligations. And as a result of that, they have not only incurred their tax due, but they have also added penalty and interest. Now, we want to make things easier for them by uh, giving them a specific period whereby if they can be able to pay the principal, then penalty and interest is waived. Are we together? Now, now, uh, just a minute. <laughs> now, the question now should be, how do we achieve this? Section 40 D, which we are referring to, expired. It expired as at 30th, as at 31st, 31st of December, December 2023. Okay. Meaning we cannot amend it. We have to now bring a new insertion. Are we together? So can we start from there? Now bring your argument from there. Madam Speaker, the argument I'm bringing, it is for benefit for Madam yes. Speaker. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. I'm raising on the point of procedure. A few minutes ago, as you consulted, a few minutes ago, as you consulted your staff, Honorable Nandara Mafavi referred to Honorable Member as an LDU. Remember, a few minutes ago, we had to correct the record when uh, a comment was made. So you are, he was on, 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 uh, on record. The microphone was on. Are we proceeding well? When Honorable Mafabi referred to the Honorable Member as an LDU.
are penalizing those who are good taxpayers and leaving the bad one. Thank so you. the reason I'm raising is that we must make a law that you are a must apply the principle first of paying when I pay money first you apply it towards the principle then the balance can be applied at the interest uh, I, 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 they, they have issues to be responded to by the minister there was an issue that was raised by Honorable Honorable Semujo on, on the certificate Yes. To another legal challenge. The addendum that was tabled was to the Certificate of Financial Implication for Value Added Tax Amendment Bill value. 2024, which we have issues with. So I wanted to inquire so that we get a good understanding. Both reports, the committee report and the minority report, are to the effect that the certificate of financial implications for this tax procedures code amendment bill is defective. How do we remedy it? Because the remedy they provided was for the earlier one, the VAT amendment bill. So now we still have a challenge here because that's both reports are raising this challenge. We need to deal with it. Madam speaker we i wish to lay on table the additional information to the certificate of financial implications for the tax procedures code amendment bill 2024 madam madam speaker I beg to read. Can you read for me the additional information? Read for me the whole information. Madam Speaker, the information we provide here is that the bill is expected to achieve the following one to improve compliance and ease tax administration, raise revenue and attract investment. To, since this is an amendment to, to the existing tax provision, there is no expenditure plan specifically different from the overall allocation of the URA budget for this financial year and the next financial year. On the funding and the budgetary implications, the cost of implementation will be fully accommodated within the medium term expenditure framework and within the ceilings of URA. We also state the economic impact of the bill to the economy and we also state that we cannot now quantify the revenue estimates at present because we don't know how much property will catch fire in this financial year. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Yes, uh, there is a procedure. Yeah. There is a procedure. Thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker. Procedure comes first. Right Honorable Speaker, I think on Friday we left for the same, same reasons. Then going forward, would it be proceed better if the minister begins by laying that information? for every bill that we are going to handle. Because it looks like he has to be reminded that we left for this purpose and uh, it has to be the law to come back to say, hey, we meant business over this. Can we have the minister right on our, for every bill begins by laying that additional information if true, that's the process. True, true. Thank you. I had actually told the minister breakfast. Motion. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, uh, I'm on the floor. Thank you. They have not given it. They have not given it. Madam Speaker, 
Madam Speaker, we, are, we have discussed this matter, and some of these uh, arguments can actually be amended during the committee stage, as you have clearly guided. I would like to move that we move to the committee stage so that we can process this bill on this issue. Thank you. Honourable members, when a, when a motion comes in, huh? the motion takes precedence. Not so. Silo, not so. Is that seconded? Seconded by Professor Silo uh, Martin. So when you're standing, I will think. Ah. By the whole side. Uh, the right, the NRM side. I put a question those in favor of, uh, of the motion for us to go to the committee stage. Say on the contrary. Aye. That is a bit. 24 be read the second time. Those in favor say on the contrary. Aye. That is a bit. The tax procedures code amendment bill 2024. Bill's committee stage. part of the bill was in favor say and the control in a the highest of it close to i put a question that close to stands part of the bill was in favor say and the control in a the highest of it new close uh after close to the following that we amend section 40 d of the principal act adding D, and B amended as follows. In A, subsection 1, by substituting the words at 30th June 2023, by 31st December 2023, and the words be substituted by inserting Substituting the words 30th June 2023 and by 31st June 2023, the words 30th June 2024 by 31st June 2024. And justification is to increase the period within which the commissioner may waive the payment of interest and penalty where a taxpayer voluntarily pays the principal. I beg to submit. Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I beg to improve the Chair's proposal as follows. First of all, as I said earlier, Section 40D expired, and therefore we cannot amend an expired section the of the law. Yes. So, and in this regard, I would like to propose that we, an insertion of a new clause as to read as follows. Section 40 E A sub sub clause A any interest and penalty outstanding as at 30th June 2023 shall be waived where the taxpayer pays the principal tax by 31st December 2024. Section 40EB, to take care of Honorable Mafavi's concern, where the taxpayer pays part of the principal tax outstanding as at 30th June 2023 by 31st December 2024 the payment of interest and penalty shall be waived on a pro rata basis. I beg to 
Honorable Nathan. Uh, uh, I want to thank the minister with the improvement, but, uh, but what I wanted to state is that that's a good one, but what I'm saying is that any taxpayer who pays any money should be applied first towards the principal. Yes. Then the outstanding is the one, because we want to avoid apportionment. I want the minister to agree with me that any taxpayer who makes any payment shall be applied first towards the principal tax. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker. I think uh, the information I want to give is uh, when you look at the Tax Produ Procedures Code Act, uh, Section 38, it states the order of payments where a taxpayer is liable to a tax and interest. They have set the order through which uh, URA should be following. And uh, the first item is the payment should go to the principal tax, then bid should go to the penal tax, then the balance remaining is applied against the interest due. I think mm -hmm. it's about implementation. URA probably is doing it uh, wrongly. They are not following the law. It should yes. be administrative. Yes. So, so are we okay with the amendment of the minister? Madam Chair, I think that uh, I want to thank my colleague for raising the, for clarifying, because the law is there regarding the, the prioritization of the taxes paid. So I think the, we should support the minister's proposal, because the problem here is about ledgers, ledger reconciliation to establish taxes due. So with the proposed amendment by the minister, we should be able to see uh, at least a proper application and following the law, the taxpayer should not have a problem. If you pay full, you have full wave of interest and penalty. If you have part, then it is uh, dealt with on a prorata, but dealing with the principal first. Madam Chair. Honorable Katesh, I think what you have heard from Karim, Honorable Karim, is saying under the law, you should first apply any tax paid on principal. But these guys in the bank bench, they always, whenever you pay, they apportion a portion on principal and partly to the interest, which is wrong. And that's why we want that the minister has come. He has said it. And now it is since they have heard. Where you have erred, it is high time you corrected with your agent. I thank you. Report of the Committee of the Whole House. Honorable Minister. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. I beg to report that the Committee of the Whole House has considered the bill entitled the Tax Procedures Code Amendment Bill 2024 and passed it with amendments. Motion for adoption of the report of the Committee of the Whole House. Honorable Minister. Madam Speaker, I beg to move a motion that the report from the Committee of the Whole House be adopted. I put a question that the report of the Committee of the Whole House be adopted by this House. Those in favor say on the control nay. Aye. Aye. Yes, I Bill's third reading. The Tax Procedures Code Amendment Bill 2024. Minister. Madam Speaker, I beg to move that the bill entitled the Tax Procedures Code Amendment Bill 2024 be read for the third time and do pass. I put a question that the uh, Tax Procedure Amendment Tax Procedures Code Amendment Bill 2024 be read the third time and do pass. Those in favor say and the control and nay. Aye. The eyes of it. A bill for an act titled the Tax Procedures Code Amendment Act 2024. Title settled and the bill passed. We need a cake. We need a cake. Yeah. Bill's second reading, the stamp to move a motion that the Stamp Duty Amendment Bill 2024 
be read for the second time. Seconded. Seconded by Takamoma. Charging equipment and for other related matters. Chair. Have you the certificate? The certificate was laid and then the additional information. Man, be sympathized with the. And fully funded. Honorable Namuga is a very good friend to Honorable Musas. For some time. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Speaker, we accompany the bill with the certificate of financial implications. I now would also wish to provide additional information to the bill for use by this house. Thank you. Thank you. Why, why don't you read that, your certificate, your additional information? Uh, Aji made the congratulations for a baby girl. Congratulations. Achieved <laughs> as a result of implementation of this bill and I would like to present them as follows. One, it will encourage businesses to invest in new projects, expansions, and innovations which lead to increased productivity, job creation, and economic growth. Two, it will enhance Uganda's competitiveness by enabling businesses to access affordable capital. Three, it will encourage entrepreneurship by making it easier for businesses to access funding, hence innovation, competition, and diversification within Uganda's economy. In terms of expected expenditure, we intend to implement this bill using the existing resources already provided for under URA budget for next financial year 2024-25 and also we have provided the cost for financial year 2025-26. We have provided the impact of the bill on the economy and Madam Chair for emphasis we also state that the revenues generated from this bill will depend on how much capital we attract from venture capital and private equity. And therefore, at this time, it is very difficult to state reliably how much revenue this bill will generate. Expression that some, some clauses will be rejected. Uh, 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 yes. Right, Honorable Speaker, what, what I have here, similar to what the Minister has read, the addendum, as he's calling it, the one for tax procedures court, let me read this verbatim, estimates of revenue, revenues expected from improved compliance but cannot be quantified at present. In that very one he has read, he's also saying it cannot be quantified at present. You see, the law again is clear, section 76 of the PFMA which also gets to come through our rules, 118. So, the, the, the law says the certificate shall, not may, shall have estimates of revenue and the expenditure. Now, when you come and say we 
cannot estimate at the moment. Because you see, it is not saying give us the exactness. It is saying shall contain an estimate. Now, even in your correction, because you, we told you go and do corrections. The corrections you have done need corrections. Because here, you're also saying the revenue expected cannot be quantified at present. That's what was in the earlier certificate which was considered defective. So, in this very one, these very ones, you're also saying cannot be quantified. Deal with what the law is saying. First, first answer that. Madam Chair, the rope referred to the tax procedures code. And in the tax procedures code, the substance of this bill was clause two, which deals with destruction of goods. What we are telling you is that at this stage, it is very difficult to measure the extent of damage of trading stock. It is very difficult to measure how much stock will expire in the period. It is very difficult to measure the extent to which stock will be obsolete. And as a result of that, this is why we are saying we... Are uh, <laughs> there is an order from... <laughs> Speaker, and my colleague Musas knows that I'm a former minister for science, innovation, and communications technology. Right, Honorable Speaker, I do respect the Honorable Minister for Finance, but with due respect, Honorable Musas, you are taking this house for granted. We are talking about a certificate of financial implication. Leave aside this on the penal code, but come to the stamp duty. And the other one you first submitted on Friday, there is nothing like financials. You are speaking a lot of history. You are doing a lot of wording without anything like a computation. Right, Honorable Speaker, with your indulgence, can the Minister for Finance be given time to get back to his office and use his technical team? No, to bring a certificate of financial implication. Right, Honorable Speaker, this 11th Parliament cannot be taken for granted. So the point of order I'm raising, are you in order to come and mislead the House by reading history instead of bringing figures on this floor? My friend, Honorable Namuga, don't worry. Madam Speaker, I wish to inform Honorable Namuga and the House no that pro procedure, procedure. in respect... No procedure. Are we here for procedure or substance? That in respect, in respect of income tax, we give estimates of revenue. In respect of excise duty, we give estimates of revenue. In respect of VAT, I also provided information on oh, revenue. Honorable That's members, yes. honorable members, we need to understand the kind of taxes we are dealing with. When somebody says you may not be able to anticipate what kind of goods will be destroyed at a what particular time, I mean, uh, tax expert. Madam Speaker, I, again, uh, these tax laws we make are sometimes helping the administration of URA to do tax collection. And the minister is right to say, as we improve the systems, you reduce on maybe the cost of collecting those taxes, but you may not come up to really to quantify what is happening. For example, we are, we are right now, you are as a stock of how much money they are demanding from taxpayers, which includes both principal and interest. interest. Already taken care of in the last law. Mm -hmm. So they are saying now, to imp that's, it's already on our books as debtors, now, because we are government. Now, when you improve, you will be reducing on debt debtors paying so that you have a cash, out, cash flow. I think, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, I don't want us there really to record. Honorable members, Madam Speaker, I know, I I know each of us has a specialty. We all have specialty. You get it, eh? We all have a specialty. 
when you get from somebody who has let's learn from each other we are not saying we know everything let's learn from each other and say okay if i don't know anything about stamp duty if i don't know anything about stamp, uh, vat let me able to be, let me be able to know understand from a person who has knowledge or needs eh? now i have not picked i have not picked listen to me i first picked a member of nrm i have picked a person from opposition and I have picked a person from opposition whom I know worked in URA under that section for how many years? Over 20 years. And I'm asking, okay, now let me hear from uh, Katesh. <laughs> Katesh, that, by that, the way, was a commissioner. Honorable. Uh, right, Honorable Chair. You know there, is, uh, there are things we should do. We should just analyze practically. I, I, on this particular one, we may have uh, chosen the minister of, uh, of uh, not being adequate on others, but let's look at this particular clause. It is more futuristic. It is saying it, when the taxpayer, at the time he's going to report the destroyed goods, where do you expect the minister at this point to know how many taxpayers in the future will have we apply to have goods destroyed. Number two, number two, even on the cost involved for that particular one, hold on. The, the minister is, the minister has indicated that the costs involved will be taken care of through the normal operations of the existing URA budget. So for this particular clause, I don't think we should be, we should be arguing about the figures because because it is not it is more futuristic Uganda